In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Uh, please guide our discussions in your Holy Spirit to be with us as we uh, travel with John Paul II to open the letter to the Ephesians. Please send us your Holy Spirit to have a greater, deeper insight into this topic. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello. All righty. So we are on audience number 88. We've just started um, part two of Theology of the Body which is called the sacrament. Um, and the first chapter, which is the fourth chapter we've covered, but the first chapter of part two um, is on the dimension of covenant and grace. And last time um, we began to look at what does the term sacrament mean? Um, it's a visible sign that um, that reveals the divine mystery of God, and it also is efficacious, so it imparts grace. Um, and we also looked at, that asked if, does Ephesians 5, this passage that we pull out from Ephesians 5, does it speak about the sacramentality of marriage? Does it speak of marriage as a sacrament? And John Paul II answered that we have to assume it does because in the Catholic liturgy, we always use this text in reference to the sacrament of marriage. So the rule of the church is as we pray, so we believe. So since we pray as if this text is about the sacrament of marriage, therefore we believe it is. Um, so we have to ask, how does it do this? How does Ephesians 5 speak about the sacramentality of marriage? Um, so today he is going on, um, to look at where does this passage of Ephesians chapter five fit into the whole letter of Ephesians. So he, he kind of gives a quick overview of the entire letter to the Ephesians. Um, last time he spoke about the authorship in a footnote. Um, on page 466 of Michael Waldstein's translation, he has a footnote about the authorship of Ephesians that he says there's a debate about did Paul really write it, but what he, the stance that he's taking, that John Paul II is taking, is the working thesis, the working hypothesis that St. Paul entrusted some con concepts to his secretary, who then developed and finished them. So uh, when he, in, in this theology of the body, you'll hear him say like the author to the Ephesians. So he's referring to St. Paul who was writing to his scribe, his secretary, and the secretary developed these ideas. Um, so you, that when you hear the term author of the Ephesians or St. Paul, you can kind of know what he's talking about. Um, okay, so now let's go into audience number 88. So this, it starts with Ephesians chapter five in the context of Ephesians as a whole. So after the introductory glance at this classical text, we talked about what does it mean to be classical last time? Some ideas were put out that, you know, when we think of marriage, this is the text that we refer to. That's what someone said last time. Like that's classical for speaking about marriage. Um, also, when I think of the word classical, I think of like great, works like classical works of literature um so maybe this this text could be great in some way and i think john paul ii would describe it as such um like all, but we also talked about the whole bible is the word of god the whole bible is um is scripture and it's, it's god's divine word but this this text has a way has a lot of truth condensed into it um so after the introductory glance at this classical text, we should now examine the way in which this passage, which is so important, both for the mystery of the church and the sacramentality of marriage, is placed in the immediate context of the letter as a whole. So later on, when we go actually into Ephesians chapter 5, 
verses 22 through 33, we'll see how it reveals so much about the mystery of the church and the sacramentality of marriage. But the author begins this letter by presenting the eternal plan of man's salvation in Jesus Christ. So this eternal plan of man's salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, I wanted to read it. So this is from Ephesians chapter one, uh, from the number one of audience number 88. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ chose us in Christ to be holy and immaculate before him in love, predestining us to be his adopted sons through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he has given us in his beloved son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, to realize this design in the fullness of time, to bring everything together in Christ as head. So Ephesians speaks about this eternal mystery that's hidden in God, and that is revealed in the fullness of time in Christ. When Christ came, he revealed this, this mystery of God that had been hidden in God. And he revealed this and also our plan of salvation, the plan of salvation that God had for us. Um, yeah. So after this profound and suggestive unveiling of the mystery of Christ in the church, the author passes in the second part of the letter to more detailed instructions that are intended to define Christian life as a vocation flowing from the divine plan, which we spoke about earlier. That is from the mystery of Christ in the church. So this eternal mystery of God that was revealed in Christ, that God is a communion of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he's destined us to share in that communion. Um, this is the mystery, and this is where our vocation stems from, from this mystery of Christ in the church. Um, so this is where the Christian mystery comes from, what, what, how we're called to live. Uh, we we are called to enter into that love that we see in the blessed Trinity. We see that God, the father, son, and Holy spirit is a communion of love. And so we're called to imitate God, to imitate Christ, to enter into that love as well. With these words, the author of the letter wants to illustrate the climate of spiritual life that should animate every Christian community. At this point, he goes on to the domestic community, that is, to the family. So he speaks about the Christian community at large in this, in this letter to the Ephesians. Um, but then in, in the letter, so we're analyzing the letter to the Ephesians, the different parts in this audience. Um, then he'll go to the family in particular. And we're going to see how Ephesians chapter 5 is about marriage, the relationship between husband and wife. Um, verses 22 through 33. However, right before, right in the immediate context, we see uh, the author to the Ephesians speaking um, about fa the family, about the family, the wider family. So we can easily observe that the essential content of this classical text, so the classical text would be Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, appears at the intersection of the two main guiding lines of the whole letter to the Ephesians. So this, this passage that we're going to be analyzing in, in greater detail in, in future audiences comes at this intersection between the mystery of Christ, which is realized in the church as an expression of the divine plan for man's salvation. And the second is the Christian vocation as the model of life of baptized persons in particular communities, corresponding to the mystery of Christ or the divine plan for the salvation of man. So this, this passage that we're going to focus on about marriage is situated right in the middle, right in this intersection of this reflection on Christ, this mystery of Christ, and the, the divine plan or the Christian vocation for how we're to live. Um, 
Okay, in the immediate context of the passage, the author of the letter tries to explain in what way the Christian vocation understood in this way must be realized and shown in the relationship between all the members of the family. That's not only between husband and wife, which is the precise subject of the passage chosen by us, but also between parents and children. So this letter to the Ephesians speaks about all the relationships of the family between parents and children, and it even goes into relationships with slaves. Slaves were considered part of the household at that time. So it goes into some rules for that as well. Thus, the text of Ephesians we are proposing as the object of deeper and more thorough analysis so that the text that he's proposing is Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. This, this te text or passage is found in the immediate context of teachings about the moral obligations of the society of the family, the so-called house to found or domestic codes according to Luther's definition. And we find these domestic codes in other letters as well. So instructions for the family. Still, one should note that Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, focuses as such only on the spouses and on marriage, while points regarding the family in the wider sense are found nearby. Okay, and then this letter to the Ephesians um, ends with an appeal to a spiritual battle, this taking up the armor of Christ. Um, and he says, John Paul II says that this appeal for a spiritual battle seems to be logically based on the argumentation of the whole letter. It is, so to speak, the explicit point of arrival of its main guiding lines. So the, it's sort of a natural conclusion of this letter to speak about this spiritual battle. Okay, and now here's where we're going next time. Um, so having before our eyes in this way, the overall structure of the whole letter of the Ephesians. So that's what he did in this audience, gave us the, whole, the structure of Ephesians. We will try in the first analysis to clarify the meaning of the words, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ addressed to husbands and wives. So this is actually from Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, <laughs> right before the, the classical text he defined. Um, but it's this phrase, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So we'll look at that next time. A uh, couple of announcements. We have Theology of the Body retreats coming up in Pittsburgh um, and in Mexico City. So if you're interested, let me know. Um, rosary every night at 9 p.m. Central Time. Divine Mercy at 3 p.m. Central Time. And if you'd like to support this ministry in um, prayer, I would appreciate it, or in financial support, I would accept that as well, too. Okay, so what were your thoughts about this audience? It's kind of a, you know, not so deep. It's like a big summary of, of Ephesians, right? So... Hey, one question that is going through my mind, and Nick or anyone else, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Why is the appeal for spiritual battle the logical conclusion of the argument made in the letter? I didn't quite see that connection. That's a good question. He just says he just says that it is um, the logically based on the argumentation of the whole letter. He says it's the point of arrival of the whole letter. He just says that he doesn't really show any examples or explain. But it's a good question. Do you have any ideas of how it could be? Like. I guess because the whole letter was like he he talked about we talked about the mystery of Christ first and then the Christian vocation, how you know how we're to live, and then more particular to 
Christian communities and the family, um, how the family is called to live. And then he ends with this spiritual battle. So it, maybe it's getting more and more particular. Um, I don't know. That's an idea. <laughs> This is way off, but I mean, I have a good question, Amos. Uh, but, you know, my sort of gut feeling here is that, you know, he has in mind Humani Vitae and the attack on the, on the family, which is why he wrote Theology of the Body in the first place. So, you know, he's talking about, uh, you know, we have to get our, our, strengthen our faith from that unity in Christ and, you know, the grace and the redemption and, and all of that, you know, and then he, he lays down what that means for husbands and wives and children, you know, for the community or whatever it is. And then he says, be ready for the spiritual battle. So he might be, I mean, I don't know that in St. Paul's time, it was really any different than it is now. Um, but uh, but now I think that John Paul might have been thinking about, you know, the attack on the family and all of that. It's just my guess. I'm just guessing. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think some of it is just the fact he considers the uh, Christian life as one of a, a battle. Mm -hmm. And so this whole letter after he expresses the gratitude or whatever in the beginning is just pointing out, you know, how we have to live this out and how we have to live this out involves a challenge. Does that answer your question, Amos? Or are you still yeah, get me some ideas. Nick, what you said and what Michelle said um, sounded like they complemented each other very well. Um, and Ed, I'm trying to think about if the author of Ephesians intention is to just spell out, here's the Christian life and here's the high points of it. Is that, is that your take on how it's, how JP2 is structuring this chapter? It's a, it's, structured in terms of how we live it out as the body and uh, I believe that you know each of the individual uh, persons within the body sort of have to uh, be set up to uh, do the battle that's the Christian life well and also maybe the meaning of Trinitarian love and all the different relationships How so, Michelle? Well, I mean, uh, you know, from the main, from the main uh, quote, you know, it's basically that, you know, God wants to marry us, right? So we are going to, and in heaven, the idea is, you know, we enter into the divine, trinitarian, eternal fire of love or whatever, and then. You know, but in Ephesians, it talks about, well, how are men and women supposed to live with each other that are married? And then it talks about children. And it says something about how we live in community. And so it, it might be just, I mean, you, I think you asked what would the author be trying to do is basically trying to explain to us how we live in Trinitarian love here and now, you know, and then at the end, you know, he goes on to say, well, you know, Jesus wants to marry you, you know, in 525 or where, 25 through 31 or whatever. Jesus wants to marry you as Jesus loves the church, you know. So. And so now once you are living this Christian life and you've entered into Trinitarian love with the, with the Lord, you're open to that spousal love. Um, you have the grace to battle.
I don't know. I'm guessing. <laughs> This is one of my favorite letters. Yeah, I appreciate how, how John Paul II kind of gives the broad strokes first. He kind of lays out <laughs> the broad picture of Ephesians and shows where this text that he's chosen to analyze in more detail fits in. You know, it seems like it gives us the, the big picture. Sorry, I was just gonna say it seems especially important in a text like this, uh, you know, uh, that's been picked out because to not contextualize it is, I think, in some ways, how people tend to uh, um, go off on tangents and overreact or whatever. Mm. But I think he summarizes Ephesians in a really beautiful way, you know, like, uh, like just how he sees the whole picture of the letter and kind of sees the different parts and ties it together. Um, I can't do that, you know, when I'm listening or reading scripture, like that's, that's challenging, but it's, it's nice that he kind of laid that out for us. Yeah, in the first part, St. Paul does this. In the second part, he does that. Um, you know, and it kind of shows the, the direction of Paul's thought. The well, one thing I really appreciate actually about theology of the body is, you know, the, the, uh, the ubiquitous and eff effusive use of scripture. It's like doing a Bible study, you know? I'm, I'm doing a study of uh, love and responsibility at the same time. And I'm just always amazed that it's so different than theology of the body because there's like hardly any scripture in there. And, and theology of the body is so full of scripture. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still amazing. Like love and responsibility is amazing, but he's just like writing based on philosophy and psychology yeah, but the theology. Oh, the that's an observation. Observation. His observation. Right? Mm -hmm. Phenomenology as well. Yeah. Right. Nicholas is very quiet. I'm always. I always like his questions. <laughs> well, for me, in in sections two, three, and four. I was fascinated and really enjoyed that even though we're going to focus on marriage, sections two, three, and four discuss children from various perspectives. We are children. We have children. Children are a significant portion of the marriage unit. But what bothered me is earlier in, in Ephesians 1.5, he talks about adoptive sons. And I, I kept circling back and saying, wait a minute, what are adoptive sons? Are they adoptive sons and daughters? Because I've never heard of sons used to mean male and female. So what are adoptive sons as Paul uses it? And St. John Paul doesn't mention that at all. Mm. Did yeah. that... Go ahead. Now, I was just gonna say, did that strike anybody? Yeah, I grappled with the whole idea of uh, adopted sons. And I wonder why we don't talk about sons and daughters. But then I thought, you know, your firstborn son inherited something special. And it was something that sons received. And when we receive all of God's divine life, it would have to be that kind of inheritance. Okay. Nick Grant, I've always understood it to mean sons and daughters. Um, and I think the emphasis on sons is that we have a share in the sonship of Christ. 
um, the grace he won for us through his redemptive act um, comes down to us. And that's why the Holy Spirit is described as the spirit of sonship. Um, and that's why the church fathers would say we are sons in the son. Um, but I always understood it to be broader than just only males or um, we have an identity that is a male identity as children of God. But that's just the way I've always interpreted it. Yeah, I always, I always wonder the female perspective sometimes whenever I hear like, think like that we become adopted sons, like, because I think, yes, it refers, because it refers to daughters too, right? Like women are also called to this um, uh, predestining us to be his adopted sons through Jesus Christ. I mean, we know that women are also called to this um, predestining to be adopted children of the father, like daughters of the father. Uh, um, but yeah, I guess it's just the language. Sometimes we just use the male word, right? To refer to everyone. Oh. Again, I, I think what Amos mentioned and a little bit of what I mentioned too, um, the sonship that we're getting is Christ and it's a sonship that is understood in the context of back then when the firstborn son received everything of the fathers. And so that's what we're receiving. We're receiving that type of inheritance even though we might be male or female yeah and tying in with that if you guys remember in the book of exodus around chapter 19 or 20 right before the 10 commandments show up um, the nation of israel which was just led across the red sea out of egypt um, who has just been rescued by god god gives them a promise that the nation of israel as a whole will be the son of God. So God speaks to this covenant relationship using um, father-son terminology. Um, and it's interesting that it's the collective. So it doesn't really have like the male identity in the same way that um, Zion is referred to as daughter Zion. Uh, Zion being the city of Jerusalem or in some ways representing the best of the Jewish people um, is referred to as daughter Zion, but it doesn't really have the feminine identity so much. I'm trying to remember back when we were focused on the, um, what was it? Matthew 5, 27 and 28, the adultery in the heart, whether it was John Paul who made it clear that this was true, even though written from the, male to female perspective, it was true in both directions. Mm. Or was it we who said that to explain, to explain the, uh, that it wasn't just a, a male position of sinning through the heart? I think it they was John, remember? It was John Paul. It was, I think it was, yeah. I think he did, just a quick comment about that, that this, this needs to be, understood vice versa. I believe so. I'd have to go back and, and find it, but I think so. Yeah. So Nick Grant, as I'm sitting here thinking um, about how sensitive our culture is to differences in gender and the meaning of gender. Um, I wonder if when John Paul II wrote this back in Poland, those weren't the biggest of issues that he was trying to address. Um, and so that makes me think like, 
do you think that he would word things a lot differently if he was writing for Americans in 2021? I, I would hope so. But I think you have to be careful though too when you, when you try to do that with broad strokes. I remember when my uh, going to mass with my dad and uh, I guess through the influence of my mom, they were um, changing all the, the uh, pronouns and such. And so in, in the holy, 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 it says, blessed is he who comes, who comes in the name of the Lord. And he would switch it to, blessed are they who come. And I had to tell him that the, the blessed is he is a quotation from the Old Testament about the Messiah coming. And so that distorted the whole thing. And so uh, you really have to uh, walk a, a tightrope in how you do that and understand when the gender applies and when it really was just more of a, a uh, situation where the male pronoun was used. So, I might answer um, Nick's or no, Amos's question about had he written it later, I had posted onto the um, site a book that I found titled The Supreme Vocation of Women According to St. John Paul II by um, Melissa Marianne. And it's fascinating because it is written based on things he was saying towards the end of his life where he spent a lot more time focusing on inequality of women, problems with, uh, with uh, how both Judaism and Christianity had treated women and all of that. And so I would argue that later in life, he might've picked up on adoptive sons and said, and by the way, as opposed to just saying, hey, that's really important and us going, yeah, but what does it really mean? Or is this a dig at, women. I would agree if it was, if he's making a point of clarification, that would be helpful because we are so sensitive to that. Whereas I think in earlier years, women didn't necessarily feel excluded by the um, use of male pronouns. Yeah, I remember when I was in grade school in the 1980s, I went to a Catholic grade school and every teacher who worked in the school was female. And I was told that man could mean both male and female, but woman always meant female. So if you yeah. said um, all men are equal, that included males and females. And doesn't that even go back to Genesis where the, the um... And some of it maybe even um, how the wording goes. But I mean, you know, you have uh, Adam who is man, but that man prior to Eve was non-gendered. And so when we talk about mankind, it's in, this, in the same sense. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting how um, words have evolved during the course of my lifetime, or at least I've heard them used in lots of different contexts. And people assume different contexts uh, when they hear things. Well, some people want to be offended e even if they know what the correct context, <laughs> context is. Well, I think some people are offended at the fact that such a context exists. Well, we are a part of a flawed history, and uh, if we don't think our history is going to be flawed for the people who see it in the future, we're kidding ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think this, this theme that we we see in if he, like the very beginning of Ephesians, like Ephesians chapter one, um, regarding this 
eternal mystery of Christ, like this mystery of Christ, this is going to be so important for later on as we go on in this study. Um, when we when we talk about the sacrament and like what a sacrament is and how how like the sacrament um, somehow connects us with that mystery, right? Like through through the sacrament and any of the sacraments we are, uh, we participate, we, we, in that mystery, we, we somehow receive the mystery of Christ. Um, so, yeah, so it'll be important for later on as well. While you're mentioning that, I got a little bit of trivia. I was listening to a uh, Scott Hahn uh, presentation on Ephesians and uh, he was talking about when he was a uh, Greek student and each member of the class was given a sentence to diagram in the Greek. And he was given the following sentence, verse three through, what is it? 14, that's all one sentence in the Greek. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, beautiful hymn of praise, but I, I wouldn't want to had, had to diagram it. <laughs> You'd probably run out of blackboard if you had to go up there and write it down. I think it was a homework assignment, so he he did he wasn't restricted to a blackboard, but I don't know how he did it. <laughs> hey, I have a trivial question here, um, and. Paragraph five and what Nick quoted. Um, John Paul II refers to the hostophone according to Luther's definition. And that just made me wonder. Like, I've never heard of Luther's definition and don't really know what it is. Why do you guys think that John Paul II included that reference to Luther's definition? I'm going to take a guess, at least initially, that since we're not from the European continent, that that might be an expression is used. Like a, a popular expression in Poland, which is right next to Germany? Um, well, it, it looks like a German word, but I mean, it, it might be just a shared concept across Europe. Yeah, it sounds like I'm gonna, it's a, I'm gonna so, Google. <laughs> it sounds like it's a well-known thing, even though I've never heard of it. Yeah, he makes the so-called, you know, domestic codes. So maybe Luther spoke about these and they were they've been discussed. So even though I've never heard about it, never been here. Now, um, and just in thinking a little bit about, you know, that sort of back and forth where all through the whole Old Testament and the New Testament, there is that sort of back and forth of calling us sons, sons and daughters, daughters. Zion is really actually feminine. Uh, with, uh, and um, so, um, you know, I have always thought that and maybe it's just because I'm simple-minded, but I've always thought that that whole argument is God is really a female or God is a male or, you know, the pronouns matter or he's trying to, you know, separate women from men and all. It's just stupid. I just really do. I think, I think it takes everything out of context all the time. And um, it's sort of like how they used, when they used a critical historical method to evaluate uh, the gospels and they found out that, that Jesus said one word. I mean, it's just overboard and under, you know what I mean? And so I, and even as a woman in particular, I'm always amazed at women who take offense at what is written in the Bible 5,000 years ago you know, or 2000 years ago, I'm just always kind of amazed um, that, 
that kind of language. And especially since in the Bible, it goes back and forth with a lot of tender care towards the female as well as the male. You know? So I guess it doesn't always have to be equal. We're different. I think another thing that's missing is the whole idea of archetypes, you know, masculinity and femininity were archetypes. And, you know, um, we're supposed to uh, accept the Marian posture, and rightfully so, because of the beauty of that receptivity. And we look at the poetry of St. John of the Cross, where, again, we have to take become the, the uh, bride. And, and it, it, I'm saying it's not easy. I, for the longest time, I would uh, stop reading John of the Cross because I just couldn't uh, deal with that. But it might be how I was conditioned too. Where uh, back then it might might have less been less of a uh, issue. Hmm. Well, here's one more little trivia for you. <laughs> In the last. In the three audiences so far, there has been reference to Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, or 22 to 33. And there's actually quite a huge theological discussion as to whether verse 21 goes at the end of the previous verses and reflects in that direction, or goes to 22 to 33 and reflects on marriage. And that verse, which is really interesting, that's be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, when we get to the next audience, that's left out and we only do 22 to 33. But in the two previous audiences, the reference has been 21 to 33. I'm not sure it matters because you can argue that that verse is one of those great, not only a transition, but a verse of duality. It means be subject to one another as neighbors, as fellow Christians in the fear of Christ. Or it may mean be subject to one another as spouses in the fear of Christ. But it is, just let you know, it's an argument. And it's funny that what John Paul did is he used it both ways. He uses it as 21 to 33 is also 22 to 33. We also have to be careful whenever we look at chapters or verses or the titles that introduce things in scripture, because I think the uh, chapters maybe were uh, in the Middle Ages and then the uh, verses were later or something like that, but I mean, no, those are uh, artificially set. They're not a part of what's uh, inspired and can be deceptive as a uh, I think uh, some some part in Genesis one or two, there's a four division. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's the, the the first creation story and second creation story are are not divided accurately. Yeah. Yeah, did St. Jerome put those in? in the no. Fourth year? No, it wasn't him. He translated. Like, he translated something. Yeah. If, if, he, if he or around his time did anything, it was probably just the, uh, the chapters. I don't know. I, I, I taught that back when I taught uh, scripture in high, the high school students, but I can't remember exactly when yeah. the uh, chapters came in and then later on when the verses came in. I, I've heard that it was in the Middle Ages, sometime after the year 1000, so sometime in the second millennia of the Christian age. Did you hear that the, the two came in at separate times, though? Oh, after, that, part, that part I hadn't heard. Yeah, well, they, they are separate, and in, in I think it, the division of time is not small. I think it's a little bit significant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we, all of us would read our... Uh, uh, introductions to our Bibles and our introductions to each uh, letter, we might uh, 
have a little more success because uh, <laughs> not, not to pick on you, Nick, but it, almost every, uh, every letter has an introduction that kind of does similar to what uh, Paul did, uh, uh, the, um, does what John Paul did with uh, um, Ephesians, given the outline and stuff. Gotcha. And, uh, yeah. and yet, you know, you, you get bogged down by over concentrating on that stuff and just analyze yes. it, uh, let the scripture speak to us. So uh, it's a it's a toad, toad answer, whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we we didn't read the introduction even that Michael Waldstein wrote in this book, which I think is is a worthy read. Oh yeah. But but I think we can get lost in reading other things besides the actual text sometimes. Like <laughs> we can read a lot about scripture, but never read scripture. Yeah. You know. So that's why I kind of dove in. But I think I think this verse five um twenty-one, like he will speak about it coming up in reference to spouses, like be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, um, which I think it is also true, like you said, Nick, about referring to just our neighbor being, you know, being subject to one another. Um, but I think John Paul II will, will speak beautifully about how spouses are called to be subject to one another. Um, and it's net love. He, he'll say things like love never allows for like a one-sided domination or submission of one to the other. This is not what, for example, male leadership in the family, like the, the father being the head of the family is never a one-sided um, domination or submission other than what what true submission would be would be under under the mission of of the husband which the husband is called to love and to give himself um, for the sake of his bride to protect her to give his life for her um and so that's that's the that what it means to be the head of the family um But we shall go into some of those things later on. We go along. So any other thoughts or, or things about this audience? I think because he goes into it in depth, you know, this is just an overview. So it's sort of hard to talk about yeah. the overview. Yeah. But well worth the read. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Great, thank you for your participation. And um, and Michelle, thank you for adding a little bit of the feminine touch to this uh, otherwise male uh, gathering. <laughs> yeah, I just think, you know, when I hear women just whining and complaining about all that, especially American women drive me crazy because I've worked a lot in the third world and, you know, <laughs> American women really have very little to complain about. And so it just drives me crazy. I can't even stand it, you know, cause I've done that kind of work of carrying a baby on my back and working in the fields with people and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, American women just do not realize <laughs> how good we have it. I mean, I'm not saying that there are women who aren't oppressed or abused or whatever of that sort, but, you know, we have laws in our country and we have, um, we have uh, a lot of things under control that allow women uh, opportunity and uh, escape from oppression, really. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, but. I, I think a lot of the outrage these days is driven by uh, forces other than just people interacting. I think the media spins it and mm -hmm. in universities it gets spun and just a lot of other areas. And people then 
unfortunately take a role of being victimized when they're, it really isn't that bad. Well, I mean, we're going to talk about this later on and we should go, but basically men and women are complementary. They're not meant to be competing against one another. True. And see, I think that's one of the problems is that it's not that a woman can't be a better soccer player than a man player, for, for example, maybe that happens, I don't know, or a particular, but it, that's not the point. You know, maybe she is athletically as good as he is, but that, that's not what defines her as a woman. That competition. Mm -hmm. Anyway. This is why John Paul came up with feminine genius. We got to recognize each other's gifts. Right. Mm. Yeah. Right. He wrote that later. I'm not, I need to look up what year he wrote. Familiar Stigitatum. Is it 1994? I'm not sure. I have to look that up. Um, but yeah, that was after Theology of the Body. Um, <laughs> Which encyclical, Nick? Uh, Mulieris Dignitatum, On the Dignity oh, yeah. of Women. Yeah. Oh, I, That's a good I one. I remember reading it. that. Okay. I remember find, there's several that, you know, if you read St. John Paul II's other writings, you find some of the same truths that he talks about, like in Theology of the Body. You'll find them in like a nugget form in other writings. <laughs> this is kind of cool. Well, it's in all his all of his letters. There's theology of the body, all of them, mm. all of the encyclicals everywhere. I mean, it's just like it's, you know, and it was really the it's because it's our Christian anthropology. It defines who we are, you know. And if you know who we are, then it's easy to talk about, you know, what we're supposed to be doing. Okay. All right. well, let's end in prayer. Thank you so much. Sorry to cut us off. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this meeting. Thank you for everyone who came and was able to participate. We pray glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.